actually founded and ran a medical device startup for four years. But most recently, I spent four months in Silicon Valley at the think tank called Singularity University. So just quick show of hands, does anyone know about Singularity University? Yeah. Um, are people familiar with the term the singularity? OK, awesome. Um, so very quickly, uh, it's tech think tank. It's based on the NASA Ames Research Center. And the mission is figuring out how to use incredible exponential technologies to address some of the most important challenges of our world. So uh, one of the co-founders is Ray Kurzweil. Uh, so he is the director of engineering at Google. He has a plethora of inventions like the flatbed scanner. Uh, he's also kind of that eccentric who wants to live forever. Um, but he's the one who kind of popularized the term the singularity um, in his book, The Singularity is Near. And from my experience there, um, basically, it was this kind of big punch in the face to realize that the world is changing really, really fast. So if there is one thing that you remember from this talk, it's that tomorrow is going to be very, very different than today. So this is the graph that I'm going to keep bringing up. Um, your classic exponential, uh, doubling every time period. And uh, the most popular exponential in technology comes from the founder of Intel. And that's Mr. Gordon Moore. And he kind of started figuring out, and after you know, a few years of building um, integrated circuits, that there was this trend. And he wrote a paper where he stated, the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years. Now this is very, very powerful. Basically, it's actually every like 12 to 18 months, but call it two years. There's a doubling every two years of the amount of circuits. And so I'm gonna kind of sh take you a little bit on a journey on what this actually feels like. So the ASCI red, so this was released in 1997, $55 million, 1 1.3 teraflops. And this was the first computer to kind of go and break through that one teraflop barrier. It was roughly the size of a tennis court, and it was used by the military to simulate radioactive fallouts for World War III and to process complex weather climate system, uh, models. So just Nine years later, this is 2006, you can go into a Best Buy and buy a Sony PS3 for 4.99, 2.1 teraflops. So we are going in nine years from a time where you have the military using this technology to simulate World War III to now children playing World War III games in their bedroom. This is pretty incredible. So, you know, the one trend in computing is this kind of supercomputer trend of like how much computational power can we have. The other related trend is going small. And this is giving birth to the whole Internet of Things movement. So right here, 1956, this is a hard drive. If you have a plane, perhaps you can move it around. Um, you know, fast forward 2005. We got those little SD cards for our, photo, uh, for our cameras. So that's 128 megabytes. Then 2014, we get a thousand fold improvement. Same price, thousand fold improvement. And 128 um, megabytes. Oh, sorry, gigabytes. It's incredible. This is the Cray-1. This is the world's first supercomputer, released in 1975. 160 megaflops. The Pi Zero, released in 2015, $5. More computational power than the first supercomputer. And, and just to keep in mind, this Pi Zero is a full-scale computer. You can put a mouse on it, a keyboard and run Windows on it. Incredible. 
Now, this little chip is the reason why everything is going to be smart. So the free scale Kintis. Uh, <laughs> for 75 cents, you can add this to anything with a cord and make it smart. Do you need a smart toaster? Probably not, but this is why you'll have one. It's because it's pretty much free. So a great example um, in the medical field uh, or in the medical realm um, is this incredible social entrepreneur that started uh, this company called Nextleaf. So there was a problem. 25% of vaccines were being spoiled in the developing world. And the problem was you just didn't know if they went bad. So what this entrepreneur did is they got a $25 cell phone made in China, a few cents of, uh, cents of electrical wires, and then a software on it that basically sent a text message to a nurse if there was a break in the chain of temperature. In the last three years, this has gone all throughout India and in six African countries, and everywhere it is, the problem is gone. Now, the reason this is incredible is this isn't hard to do. You know, th this isn't rocket science, you know. Um, what's incredible is that anyone can do this, and it's truly a matter of picking the problems that you want to tackle. Are there any fan, Ray Kurzweil fans in the house? People that don't like Ray Kurzweil? Okay. Um, anyhow, I was going to say, if it's a picture, no name dropping. Uh, but anyhow, Ray, co-founder uh, co at Singularity, um, he looked at Moore's law and, and kind of said, hmm, interesting. So uh, Moore said he thought it was going to be about 10 to 20 years, the trend. It actually was 50. So then Ray said, well, he's looking at circuits per square inch. What if we change the metric and look at computations per second per $1,000? And this is what he co uh, coined the term, the law of accelerating returns. And what you see is pretty incredible. And this might be the most important graph that you've never seen before. So there's a few interesting things to note. First of all, um, Moore's law is the fifth generation of this trend, right? So if you actually look and you look at the punch cards at first and then it goes to vacuum tubes, this trend of ex uh, exponentially increasing rates of computational power has been happening for the last 100 years. Um, you also note that it's quite smooth. So even during economic downturns or war, it's still a pretty steady increase in technology. You'll also note that there's actually, it's kind of peeling upwards. So it's actually not even logarithmic, it's, it's accelerating at the end. And so why this is so interesting is that this is the basis of all these futurists and, and where, when they predict certain things of the future. So, um, you know, the one kind of symbolic milestone that people have been talking about is when will a computer be computationally as smart as a human. And it turns out that it's just around the corner. So 2029 is when, based on this forecast, one computer is, has the same computational power as a human. What's even more interesting is looking out further into the future. So again, logarithmic, it doubles every two years. So in two years after that, now one computer is two people. And taking that even further, 2050, 2060, we have seven billion brains in one single machine. So as I said at the beginning, uh, the world tomorrow is going to be dramatically different than the world today. And we're living in a world where our cell phones may at times already be smarter than we are. So I'll, I'll 
go through a bunch of examples to kind of see this in practice. Uh, given we're in Calgary, I have to do an energy example. Um, and solar is a pretty incredible one. So here we actually have two logarithmic trends. The first is the cost of solar. And what this kind of leads us to, to see is that energy is going to be pretty much free in the future. We're going to have energy companies. They're always going to figure out a way to charge you for services. But it's pretty profound to think that solar is going to be pretty much free you know, to install. And some of the interesting implications are that you know, we fight wars over energy. You know? Some of our huge global health challenges are because of energy. Take water. You know? We have uh, desalination techniques, but they're so energy intensive. So this is really exciting and is going to really transform the way that business and society works. And yeah, and this is, you know, this could be a whole nother talk, but you know, we're still living in this era of scarcity um, where, you know, like oil, you only have so much in the ground. And when you actually can shift and go into an era where it is abundant, you know, that's absolutely incredible for the world. And that's the hope we have of using technologies for good. So another uh, example is genetic sequencing. And this one is incredible. So when we think about DNA, and, and it's, it's great that we had a talk before that uh, referenced these things, um, but there's the reading, um, the understanding, and then the manipulating. So I'm going to just talk about kind of the genetic sequencing part, but I wanted to note that we have a startup here in Alberta. They just moved here. They're based in Lethbridge. They set up manufacturing. They're called Amina Labs. Um, I actually advise with them, and they build these things called mini labs that they sell to junior high and high school students to teach them how to do CRISPR in the classroom. This is, like, this is not something that you get at the Berkeley lab or the MIT lab, which you know, exists and they're doing really important research, but this is really inexpensive to do and very accessible. So the whole writing is, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. So I just wanted to mention that this is happening in our own backyard. Uh, so they're called amino labs. Ah, so does anyone know how long and how much it costs to sequence the first human genome? Any guesses? Oh? A billion dollars. Almost, almost. A million dollars per base pair? No. <laughs> oh. To do the math. Uh, 2.7 billion it took about 15 years. So this is kind of a one-time investment that a nation state would make in order to kind of push a technology for them, further. So that was 1999. Now um, you can go and buy yourself a full genome sequencing. So not just parts, not like just 23andMe where they look at a certain things. Um, now you can get that for 9.99. And many say that we're almost at the $100, like full genome sequencing, but that's the latest number I was able to find. And so this is kind of where it gets very interesting. So the cost starts following Moore's law, and then in 2008, there's a sudden drop in price. And this was because of a technological innovation. It went from a Sanger-based um, t um, sequencing technology to what they call the second generation or next generation uh, DNA sequencing technology. And so th like the cost is just plummeting. And again, the same trend as we saw with solar is technology is going to zero and is nearing being free. So this is a really cool example about um, this is a company out of England called Oxford Nanopro. And this is a handheld device that can sequence the human genome. And this is what was used in Africa during the Ebola outbreak. So, you know, what does this trend mean about, you know, this incredibly inexpensive uh, genetic sequencing technology? So, as I said, 
Um, it's going to be pretty much free, um, but it's going to have a massive implication on how we do medicine. So sure, we have new drug discovery. Uh, we can inspect uh, genetic code of bacteria to see if they have antibiotic resistance. Uh, we can analyze mutated DNA of cancers so we can figure out the best treatment. But many of the futurists say that cancer is going to be completely gone in 20 years. You know, if you're under the age of 40, they say that cancer is going to be a thing of the past. And this is one of the reasons for it. There's many others, but this is one of them. So there's always, uh, with technology, there's always the good, and then there's always the uncertain or bad. Uh, this is an incredible example of an artist. And what she did is she went and collected cigarette butts from the New York subway station. She then used a $100 machine to extract the DNA from the saliva. She then did partner with a pretty sophisticated uh, lab that could kind of extract the facial features. And they 3D printed these masks of what they think those people look like. So the scary part is not what she's doing. The scary part is that most politicians don't even know this is possible. You know, if you know, you're drinking that lemonade right there, I could grab the can, I could sequence it, I could figure out what your chance of getting Alzheimer's is, and I could probably ship your genetic code to China and they could clone you at one point, right? So th this is like very real, um, and we just don't even realize that it's happening. So bringing it home to the AI theme, yes, firstly, full disclosure, I am not an AI expert. Um, but of course, these exponential trends are everywhere. Is machines teaching each other the next big exponential in AI? I think a, a really incredible example of this is Google's AlphaGo. So it was really you know, big in the headlines once when AlphaGo beat the world's best Go uh, player. So that was big. But what you maybe haven't heard is that they made a second generation uh, called AlphaGo Zero. And what's very different about AlphaGo Zero is that unlike AlphaGo that was fed huge data sets of player moves, AlphaGo taught itself. It didn't get any data sets, it just experimented on its own and eventually beat AlphaGo. Um, I think it took eight days to beat the world like of self-teaching to beat the best uh, champion and then it took about 46 of self-teaching to beat AlphaGo, the original. So I found this lovely quote because it says it better than me and this is a professor from Columbia and it writes, Data is the fuel of machine learning, but even for machines, some data is hard to get. It may be risky, slow, rare, or expensive. In some cases, machines can share experiences or even create synthetic experiences for each other to augment or replace data. It turns out that this is not a minor effect. It is actually self-amplifying and therefore exponential. So as you're seeing, this lens of an expense, uh, exponential graph is pretty powerful. And there are far-reaching implications. So one of the obvious ones is that once any technology becomes digitized, it now starts to move among this exponential curve. Um, this is really positive for the healthcare system where there's still a lot of analog information, so pr pr uh, provides a large opportunity. And if this is something you want to kind of dig deeper in, the other co-founder of Singularator is Peter Demandis, so he founded the X Prize, and he digs deeper into this, and he basically says, 
Okay, look, once a technology gets digitized, then you don't really realize that it's, you know, it's approaching because it's doubling, but the, it's so low there. But eventually, once it starts getting big enough and starts doubling at, at significant numbers, that's when it becomes disruptive. So technology that's on a doubling curve and it overtakes it without even realizing. And we have tons of examples of this. Um, the well-known one is Kodak, you know, the year that it filed for bankruptcy, you know, Instagram gets acquired for a billion with, you know, a dozen or so employees. Uh, another example is Nokia. You know, it was doing everything good, kind of status quo, but it didn't hit the trend of smartphones. And within a few years, it was gone. <laughs> so when you leave and you think about you know, your professions, your businesses, um, one thing to keep in mind is you know, incrementally increasing is just not good enough anymore. Technology is just moving way too fast. So I challenge you to think in terms of 10x and not just 10%. And so the, the hope of how technology can save us is that right now we are living in a scarcity mindset. And if we can actually you know, push these technologies and get the cost to zero, we can hopefully live in a world of abundance. So I'm gonna end on a quote uh, that I read this when I was in high school and it rings more true every day uh, this is Alan, um, Albert Allen Bartlett. He's a professor of physics from Boulder University. I'm not sure if he's still around, but he's so cute. Um, <laughs> the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Thank you very much. <laughs>